So this is a question I ask you, uh, what is intelligent? And then I'm going to ask you the following question that we are going to do a little poll on it. Have you ever heard about the idea of a singularity? Maybe what was the outcome here? Do we know? Uh, yeah, uh, we're still waiting for two more responses. Uh, so currently, uh, most people chose C vaguely, and then uh, and then people chose B, and uh, only twenty percent of the audiences chose A. Well, uh, basically, singularity is this idea that machines will be smarter than people and will take over the role of people. Uh, there are plenty of movies talking about robots and super intelligent life. Okay, and so that's what they call the singularity. There is whole groups of people that study singularity. There are singularity conferences, et cetera, et cetera. I, I can give you references and et cetera. So what do you think about this idea that machines would be more intelligent than people and, uh, um, and take over most of the human functions? Abby, what did you get there for whoever answered already? Um, most people chose B and E, plausible and I don't know. Okay, I put A and uh, that's not the right answer. Uh, but what I, the reason I said the ridiculous idea is that, yeah, there'll be a day that uh, most of the functional decisions that are reasonably repetitive will be done by machines. And there might be one day that they'll deal with the, with something that never happened. But for now, it's still pretty ridiculous. And don't believe when people say that machines are much better than people in most things, because they don't have. So let's go a little bit to history. And this guy Dreyfus we, he was with SDC, which is a think tank in the West Coast that these days does a lot of Silicon Valley support. They are kind of a funny think tank. They are for-profit think tank. And they broke AI into four areas. Game playing, problem solving, a game playing like chess playing. Problem solving is like orig resolving original equations, dealing with language, and then recognizing patterns. So that was what they, they said there. Okay, and so in the early 60s, uh, this guy Feigenbaum, professor at Stanford, said, you know, this idea of going to basic axioms and developing them in trying to develop intelligence is um, kind of misguided. What we need to do is find people with expertise and emulate this expertise into computers. So languages were developed for that and etc. cetera, uh, languages like Prolog, et cetera. Um, and uh, and uh, basically you would kind of interview, and, and by the way, um, uh, I, this slide is wrong. It's not the early 60s, it's the early 80s. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and uh, basically you would pick up an expert, like I did that with auditing, I did that with uh, stock choice and etc. Give them cases, interview them, and figured out if they had any rules that they always implemented. And uh, typically you would sit down with an interview. I remember interviewing a guy uh, who was very, very successful as a stock picker and asking him, do you have any rules? He said, oh no, it depends on the case and there's no rules. After I gave them cases and did choices, he started to say, you know what, I have a rule here. If this happens, do that. And then by the time we are done, it was about a, a week of what we call knowledge engineering. I did that with one of my PhD students at Columbia. Um, he had a big bunch of rules, and uh, which we basically implemented in a 
rule engine, which was Polog at that time, and it did pretty good. Uh, more recently, we actually worked uh, with a very large corporation you all would recognize. Uh, Abby, this is, was a Hussein project when he was a PhD student. And uh, basically, they had, uh, I can tell you who the large corporation was, uh, maybe not. Uh, they had a thing called PCARD. And PCARD is procurement card. And so they basically gave to managers at certain level, many managers, uh, American Express card. And they say you can, instead of billing and all, you know, permissions and et cetera, up to this expense level, you can uh, simply charge it to your American Express. And every month, uh, every month, uh, submit um, a reconciliation of your expense. And uh, so many companies do that. They give you PCARDs. Uh, PCARD, P standing for procurement card. And basically, the way they audited that, internal audit did, is they had a lady, and she looked at the expenses, and things like if they bought beer and it wasn't for expense, if they got uh, gift cards, if they got uh, diapers, it didn't sound right as a business expense. So she verified them, and... Uh, called the person up and asked for an explanation. Turned out that this company, uh, Procter & Gamble, I don't know why I was keeping it quiet, actually had uh, a diaper division and made sense buying some competitors' diapers to compare with their product. Okay, but there were many things. And of course, booze. Uh, if you go to a bar and spend booze, uh, might be justifiable. You're entertaining a client or etc. But there are circumstances that is not. And the thousand dollars we found this thousand dollars bottle of wine uh, wasn't quite justifiable. But so what did we do? Um, we actually interviewed this lady carefully and started deriving her rules and keep deriving the rules, creating these rules. Uh, and finish up writing a paper, and this thing was pretty good. And I think the name of the lady was Judy, and we called the system I Judy. Uh, but I can't remember. It was I can't remember her name exactly. But it was an expert system, that, and basically her role changed from a person that was looking at at uh, thousands of transactions a month. She was she was only looking at the ones that the company, that the system flagged and was thinking about improving the rules. And actually, that was a pretty common thing that you find in expert systems. Um, and so by the 90s, the mid-90s, uh, the areas of AI were natural languages instead of language translation, expert systems, cognition and learning, uh, computer vision, and uh, like pattern recognition, automatic adduction. But the interesting thing is that expert systems were something like 65% of all studies. A large number of expert system systems. A um, company called Coopers and Lyburn, which became PWC of Coopers, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, actually had a large group of people working on a tax advisor and on an audit planner. And that lasted about 10 years and then the companies abandoned it. And actually, Lynn Graham was one of the two guys who was a partner in this area. He actually left Coopers and joined our faculty for six years, I hired him. But then he went to be chief auditor of a medium-sized firm. And he's still around, he's still writing, uh, but he now works basically, I think, at Babson, Ben or Bentley, okay? Uh, but he's kind of close to retirement. But this was like uh, in the mid-90s, and somewhere in the early 2000s, uh, basically people lost a lot of interest in AI work. In this period, 
Oh, now I have my right ears here. I published six books on expert system in accounting and auditing in the artificial intelligence accounting audit series. And the algorithms we had in there and the examples we have in there are still viable algorithms for what they call AI today. A um, guy called Glenn Gray, professor at University of California, Northridge, California State Northridge, and two of our PhD students, about five years ago, decided to ask the following question. I think it was Jundai and uh, Jundai and someone else. Um, they uh, decided to see what happened to expert systems, because you don't hear about this uh, in the artificial intelligence um, literature so much. You hear about object recognition, about many different things, about process automation, intelligent process, we don't hear. It. And basically their conclusion is this thing became part of corporate information systems. If you go and borrow money, means use your credit card for American Express, they actually have an expert system that applies the rules they have on approving expense. Typically, small expenses are automatically approved, and that's in the software that they have. However, a more complex expense, a higher expense, might be rejected based on the rules that they have. And this system that they have is called Falcon, and is actually a contracted system. Is not, I don't think, is American Express system itself. Um, basically, it's an expert system that performed this function. So basically, Glenn Gray's conclusion is that they, these systems have been impounded into large corporate systems, and they still exist intensively. In 64, McCarthy started the AI lab at Stanford. Two decades later, in 84, that original optimist hit a rough patch, and he called it the AI winter. And uh, basically, a lot of people doubted that AI would ever get anywhere. And remember what I said about AI. AI is basically a conglomerate of technologies, some better, some worse, performing things that humans typically perform, but many of them humans never thought of doing and these technologies are doing. Uh, however, there has been this kind of the hype cycle of disappointment, but I don't think there are too many people today that doubt that AI uh, is very, uh, a very important thing. Um, I, I don't want to say another thing. Uh, I actually, these are my old slides. And uh, when was it? Maybe two weeks ago, I did a presentation for PwC and they had a AI workshop. It was basically two days, half days, uh, virtual they i had promised to go to tampa and talk and would be a presential but with corona became a distance and they had over a thousand people listening to ai and they had microsoft talk they had um, some of the internal researchers talking uh and they had a, a kind of a startup talking and there there was a lot of discussion of functionality. What can you really do at this moment with AI? And there was a lot of jive too. There was a lot of, particularly the Microsoft presentation was very much like trying to sell something to PwC. Okay. Um, okay, let's see how my time is doing here. I have a little bit of time. Okay. And so um, I joined Bell Labs in 84 from Colombia. And uh, it was kind of strange, the whole thing. Actually, what got me into audit research was just a coincidence. Okay, my advisor, Ted Mark from USC, was already doing auditing because P uh, KPMG had a research opportunity to auditing thing and he, he jumped into it. And I went to Bell Labs from Colombia. And uh, the CFO, a guy called Bob Kavner, was my, my friend. 
I said, you know, you are now here spending a year, it was just a year. I went to Colombia, from Colombia to Bell Labs just for a year. And uh, they say, yeah, here, go and talk to the internal audit guys. Uh, it's kind of a mess. That's what he said. I didn't repeat that to them. So I went there and there were over 300 people doing auditing. So I did the traditional thing. He asked me to do a diagnostic. I interviewed people and I looked at what work they were doing, et cetera, although I wasn't an expert in auditing. And I came out with three conclusions to them. First, they had no computers. This is 1984. Uh, the second one, they didn't use analytics. And the third one was, you know, you have a one, two, three very large systems that no one really understands, and your audit is perfunctory on that one. So you need to do something about that. And so the first one, they said, ignore, they ignored me. They just said, don't worry about it. And absolutely, I didn't have anything to worry. In less than a month, they had 300 PCs sitting on the desk because they owned a company called Conversion Technology that made PCs. And so they basically put in the desk and then they called me and asked me to give them computer lessons, like using PCs. Uh, and that's how I actually had met the people from Bell Labs. Uh, uh, I taught executive program at Columbia on technology and one of the Bell Labs guy, um, uh, guys attended it. And then he said, can you come and do this at Bell Labs? So I went there and gave a two day course. And in the end of the first day, uh, we had cocktail party and I have a few uh, glasses of wine. And the director came to me and said, why did you come and spend a year here? And I said, yes, even without thinking. And why did I do that? Because everyone there was like me, dealing with computers, and at Columbia, no one was like me. Everyone was economists. So I was very lonely there, no one to work with. I was finished up consulting for the FASB instead of you know doing the stuff I liked. I consulted for project 33 and 36, uh, inflation accounting and pension accounting. And so I, I accepted immediately. I, I went there. And that's how I got to, to do this uh, diagnostic stuff, et cetera. And so they didn't think too much about the PC stuff. I gave them the lesson. Analytics, they just didn't understand what I was talking about. But the large system concerns, they really had it. I don't know what had happened, but they were very sensitive to it. And next day, I get a call from the head of internal audit asking me to meet with him. And he said, you know, why don't you think about a methodology to improve auditing? And I said, you really need to do continuous auditing. And uh, I don't even know how I have thought of that. Um, you need to do continuous auditing. Um, and they said, so how do we do this? I said, get me a small system. And I will develop this system for you. And then you can apply the methodology. That was Bell Labs. You, you would prototype something and then they would uh, operationalize it. But they actually gave me the largest system they had. They had a thing called RCAM, which was residential uh, billing, residential customer account management. And why did they do that? That was their take back strategy. AT&T had been split in long distance company that remained AT&T and seven operating company, Verizon, Bell South, SPC and et cetera. And in the process, they lost contact with their client. And because they lost contact with the client, they needed a way to get back into the cust dealing with the customers. The way they were billing before ARCAM, they were actually sending the information to Verizon and they, you would get the bill long distance and local all together. And so they had no contest. So they spent a billion point two dollars building our camp and they really were worried about it. So I finished up with a very large system to audit and we created this architecture to do real time auditing on it. And what we did at that time was very similar 
to what I was describing to you at Procter & Gamble. I, we basically did knowledge engineering, went around the different, first understood the architecture of the system, then went around and interviewed people saying, what does the system do? Because the documentation wasn't good enough. And then we built what, let me go back. Uh, we built what we called an expert system. Uh, and this is our architecture of most expert systems. In the middle, there is this thing called inference engine. Inference engine is like backpropagation algorithms. It's basically you have 100 rules and it decides what rule interprets first. And it said, do this, do that, do that, on based on the book back propagation rules. Um, and that's the inference engine. And then most expert systems, even the thing that they call expert systems today, basically collect data in a knowledge base. Today you don't, maybe you don't collect data in a knowledge base, you basically pick up, uh, pick up knowledge structures out of downstream systems. A and then, and then, uh, it basically accumulated, and organized it somewhere. So this was the idea of what we called CPAS, Continuous Process Auditing System, CPAS. And basically, if you look in the right of this picture, there were four large data centers at AT&T um, in all around the United States. And there were 140 something uh, switches. So you pick up your telephone, it went to the switch, the switch connected you to the other person, okay? And they, these switches were like big PCs today, and they collected the phone calls information and collected really basically four types of information. The, the type of call you're doing, your number, the other number, and the duration of the call. It was a 400 byte record and basically build on, on the base of that. And for a while, uh, basically they picked up magnetic tapes on these PCs, 140 something, actually 142 location, that's a number I, I remember. And they carried the magnetic tapes to the data centers, read them and created the billing. So uh, we had to create this system that was operational. So what we did is we, uh, the idea would be today, use a database, put everything in a database. Uh, however, it was complicated. It was a very large system, uh, was still in development, uh, very expensive. We couldn't do that. So what we actually did is we pick up reports uh, that came from the system, uh, screen scrape the reports, basically take the data out of the electronic report and created a relational database that basically represented, if you look in the left, represented the system. And this was in the mid eighties, and this is like uh, today you click on a box, you go over the box, you wouldn't be surprised. At that time was uh, hypertext was a big news, we didn't embed hypertext, but we identified it and used it. And it, uh, it was deployed in, uh, in less than a year and progressively we beefed up the system. And the system also uh, was uh, not only an audit system, but became also a billing system uh, to manage the billing system. And actually uh, they ran these two, one was, we called the continuous audit and continuous monitoring system. And uh, they, they ran both of them for a while and then they finish up uh, several years uh, after, say, we don't really need two systems, let's keep the billing system and put some audit routines on it. So that's what they did. So let me ask you the following question. How do you test a machine to see if it's intelligent? This is why I, I started you in this discussion. And uh, basically there is a thing called Turing test. Uh, and you must have heard the name Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a don of Oxford, a professor. And during the Second World War, he went to work for the intelligence of the, U of the British Army. 
and he broke the German code. German had this very complex Enigma machine that basically encoded things. And uh, they transmitted information by radio with this code that the Allies didn't know about it. And Turing broke the code, and a lot of the a uh, lot of the war uh, uh, victory maybe came from the ability to predict what the Germans were going to do because they could read. If you uh, if you never uh, did that, read the book about Turing, remarkable man. A brilliant guy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and he had this thing called uh, the Turing test. And today there are the Loebner Prize and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's very simple test. You interrogate a question, and you get an answer. One generated by a person, Abby, and the other generated by a computer. If you can't distinguish what is a computer answer. And, and what is a human answer, that's an intelligent machine, according to Turing. I, I actually find that cool. And they have competitions, and they make it different contexts. It's ki kind of cool. OK, um, and this is actually this guy, James Cassio. And he's a futurist. And he basically used to say, Artificial intelligence, information technology, and virtual reality will radically change human existence in decades to come. The future is too important to leave the technologies al to technologies alone. And then he was talking. He he and John Osauk, the guy who invented the polio uh, vaccine, were talking about being a good ancestor. And what they were talking about being a good ancestor is say. A big technology comes in, uh, you need to kind of think of its effect in society. And I'm going to say something in a second that might uh, make you think about uh, for a second. But um, basically, like when they did the atomic bomb, uh, Oppenheim, Einstein, those guys were very, very nervous about what the atomic bomb would do to society. And uh, at the end, uh, they went ahead and did the bomb because uh, they wanted to win the war. And they had, uh, I guess, good reasons uh, to do the bomb. But the impact on society was tremendous. And I think if you think about electricity, same kind of thing. Uh, and both electricity and the atomic bomb, and what I'm going to talk next, have good usages, have bad usages. And I, what I always say in my classes is technology give it, technology take it. And so you cannot think this is a good technology, this is a bad technology. It's about how you use the technology. Computers are great. Being hacked is not great. Um, and goes on and on and on. So atomic bomb, electricity, and now uh, this whole thing about facial recognition, for example, is basically what I call exogenous data, is social media. Uh, all of these are technologies that can be for the good, can be for the bad. Uh, if you look at what's happening in social convolution at this moment, uh, Black uh, Lives Matter, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what you actually see is an effect of technology because uh, what you are seeing is the ability to use social media to organize much more than when I was young and we were doing Vietnam War protestations. And so again, technology has one side has the other side. And what Salk here and several other people are saying is you have to be a good ancestor. Try to understand what technology is going to do and try to deal with it. And in my slide um, for PwC, uh, I'll share them with you. Um, I always say, I said, 
uh, the the laws for taxi cabs, yellow taxi cab in Manhattan, are not very appropriate for Uber. The laws for hotels are not very appropriate for Airbnb. And of course, you can say there'll be no Ubers, no Airbnbs, um, and some countries have done that. But you know, that's stopping technology and uh, decreasing a lot of very good functionalities that you can get. Just think about the next step for Uber is self-driving Uber, okay? And the next step of self-driving Uber is cars that uh, maybe you don't have a car, you only use self-driving Ubers, okay? And could be the same thing happening uh, with you don't have a house, you live on Airbnbs anytime you want to change. And the rules for you live on Airbnbs are not the rules for Airbnb, and they are not the rules for hotels. Okay, so, uh, and this is what society is not doing very well at this moment, anticipating uh, the effects of social media, anticipating the effects of face recognition, anticipating the effects of many of these things that are emerging. And in our lives, in our audit lives, the society is not very good anticipating how financial reporting should happen and how assurance should happen. And, you know, first I shouldn't even call it financial reporting, it's business measurement. And assurance is auditing, but is basically guaranteeing that those numbers, giving a evaluation that those numbers are adequate. Okay, now I'm going to ask you another question for you to think about it. What do you think, you all, everyone knows what Internet of Things is, correct? Anyone doesn't know? Okay, let me give you a very, very brief uh, uh, introduction. If your car talks to your refrigerator and to the heating of your house, you are using the Internet of Things. If you control uh, the heating of your house, the lightning on your house, and the start of your car with your cell phone, you are talking about Internet of Things. Okay, what is Internet of Things? It's basically using uh, the communication abilities of Internet to have objects interact or your functionality, of course. Um, and just to advance this, because they're going to come back, the prediction is that in about 10 years, there is going to be something like a trillion IoT devices, Internet of Things, IoT devices. So the question that I have here for your, for your poll is, this one. What is the Internet of Things? Is it relevant? Major facilitate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Which one? But most people chose B. Yes, that's my answer too. Yeah, I, meaning IoT will be very convenient, and uh, we are still on the kind of just beginning of the IoT. Um, but it's going to be tremendous in creating convenience. And then you say, isn't IoT intelligence? No, IoT is a mechanism. But you might put some intelligence into your IoT. You can put some in, you would say, ah, oh, this is not intelligent. But you can, IoT can define, identify when you come into a room, turn the lights out, can decide what temperature the room uh, adopts, can identify your car when it's arriving and starts the heating in your house, uh, can have a little robot go and get put a pizza in your microwave oven, can do many things. And every day there'll be more things that IoT will do for